This morning's scripture is John 3, 1 through 17, read from the New Revised Standard Version. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said, said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, church. I have a question for you. What does it mean to be born again? And I ask this question because there are so many terms and phrases in the vocabulary of the church that have been misused or redefined or even co-opted in ways that cause people to run the other way in some cases. And these are terms and phrases that have come to mean something entirely different now than they did to the early church. Born again is one of these terms and phrases. It is so loaded. But the term comes from this passage in John's Gospel that we have in front of us this morning. Let me tell you a little story that illustrates uh, the baggage that comes along with this term. I've probably told this story before, some of you may have heard it, but it's been a while, bear with me. So Mary and I were living in Parisburg, Virginia, where I was the pastor of the First Christian Church there. One day, when Graham was seven months old, I took him to the local Food Lion grocery store to get groceries. And so Graham was born in January, so when you do the math, Seven months means it was August when this story took place. Now let me tell you something about Virginia in August and how hot and humid it is there. Even in the Appalachian Mountains, it's just oppressively hot and humid sometimes. Mary was working at the local hospital as a social worker and so we would often divide and conquer when it came to errands. So it was my turn to do groceries. So I had Graham with me, which was fine, because Graham was my little buddy, and I just loved taking him with me and showing him off to everybody. But it was a particularly miserable, hot, humid day uh, that day, and neither one of us did very well in the heat. Uh, We'd both get kind of cranky and irritable, which was the case on this day. So we got our shopping done, and we were walking out of this cool comfort of this grocery store into this blistering heat that just hits you like a wall. You just 
feel it rising out of the asphalt in the parking lot. And Graham, he was starting to get all twitchy and nervous and flailing and crying and things. So here I was trying to push my cart of groceries and juggle this awkward baby carrier and just trying to get to my car. So I, I got to the car, I popped the trunk, I turned around and here's a guy standing there. And he is in a short sleeve dress shirt, pressed. He's wearing this big, wide, loud 1970s necktie and polyester pants. And he says to me, brother, are you saved? Now, this wasn't an unusual thing for this time and place in the world. Uh, so it's not like I was ready to pull out a can of mace or anything like that. I kind of knew who this guy was anyway because he represented a church in town uh, that was known for approaching people in a parking lot for salvation inspections, for lack of a better term. Uh, most people were smart enough to either avoid him or say whatever it took to pass inspection, right? But here I was, a fairly new dad, trying to load groceries in my car with a seven-month-old baby who was literally having a meltdown. So I said yes, thinking that this would be a sufficient answer for him. But then he asked me, but are you born again? See what I mean about this term now? And I said, listen, I'm the pastor over at the First Christian Church here, and I've been a Christian for 14 years. Uh, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. I'm okay. You're okay. You know. But then he proceeded to question me. He, he asked these seven very denominationally specific questions to test my orthodoxy. And meanwhile, Graham is working himself up to a point where if I don't get him into the car and get the air conditioning running, this guy's going to call his pastor to come over and perform an exorcism on my baby. So I finally said, you know, this is not the time and place to have this conversation. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Would you please just let me get my baby home before he explodes? And I was so mad. You know, why in the heck did this guy think that the best way that he could be of service to me was to quiz me about whether I met his criteria for salvation or his definition for born again? You know, the best thing that he could have done for me is to ask if he could help me load my groceries into the car, which is exactly what a Boy Scout would have done in that situation. Am I right? Can I get a witness? Thank you, Troop 2, for being here with us this morning to help out. I appreciate you. Keep up the good work. Uh, God loves you. So do I. Be on the ready to rescue people from the parking lot. Keep doing what you're doing. So the story that Connie read this morning uh, starts out with a man named Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and an expert in Jewish law. He visited Jesus on the sly under the cover of night. So why did he visit Jesus at night? You know, maybe he wanted to test Jesus' orthodoxy, like this guy in the food line parking lot. But... I really don't think that's the case because most of the time when the Pharisees or the Sadducees wanted to test Jesus' orthodoxy, they tried to do it in the most public place they could in order to try to make Jesus look foolish. Nicodemus was just seeking some honest answers from Jesus. But, you know, what, what was so risky that he felt he had to sneak around at night to find these answers. Why couldn't he just talk to Jesus in the daytime during you know, normal office hours? So our theme for Lent this year is seeking. 
Honest questions for deeper faith. Nicodemus was definitely seeking something when he visited Jesus. But the first thing he said to Jesus was not a question at all. The first thing that he said was, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. That's not a question. That's a statement. But it's an important statement because the we tells me that there were other Pharisees who recognized that God was present in Jesus' life and ministry, which is important because sometimes we buy into this idea that the Pharisees in the New Testament were all bad guys. Not true. Some of them got it. But the fact that Nicodemus visited Jesus at night tells us that he and these other Pharisees who uh, got it, who recognize uh, uh, Jesus as being one with God, were in the minority. Jesus responded to this statement by making one of his own. He said, very truly, I tell you, not one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Now here is where we get into the first question that we see in this conversation. That question comes from Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus says, how can one be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And this is Nicodemus just seeking understanding. You know, he, he's not sure whether Jesus is being literal or being figurative. Uh, and this is where Jesus explains to him that no one who wants to enter the kingdom of God can do so without being born of water and spirit. And before you automatically think water means baptism and kingdom of God means heaven, so this means you can't go to heaven uh, unless you've been baptized, I want you to first consider this. In the ancient world, it was a common understanding that everyone was born of water. That's how people of that time and culture understood birth. And this makes sense. And, and it's true even today if you think about it. We all come out of the waters of birth and into a world where we draw our first breath. And remember, in the language of the New Testament, which is Greek, there is no distinction between the word breath and spirit. It's pneumatos, as in uh, pneumatic pressure or pneumonia or pneumatologist. And yes, then, everyone who is born into this world has the potential to be part of God's kingdom because we all come out of the waters of our mother's womb and become air breathers. But in order to get it, in order to enter into this kingdom of God that is so radically different from the kingdoms of the earth, Jesus says that we must be born from above or born again, as we say in the church. And to be born again means to be born of the capital S Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God. So the woman who created the graphic on our bulletins this week, uh, she was raised in a Spanish-speaking Pentecostal church in Miami, Florida, called Renunciamiento. Now the simple translation of this word is either rebirth or renaissance but for her church it meant so much more we sometimes say born again but unfortunately the picture that often comes to our mind when we hear that term relates more to this guy at, at the food lion parking lot trying to do uh, salvation inspections right but in her church renunciamiento or rebirth 
is this perpetual reminder that each time the church gathers to encounter Jesus, the Spirit calls us into continuous transformation. As we've said over the last few weeks, deep Christian spirituality is not a one and done deal. It is not a brother are you saved kind of thing either. It means calling that which is dead into Holy Spirit filled life. Now, was this what Nicodemus was seeking from Jesus that night? Possibly. But either way, it's what he received. And believe me, we are all better because of it. But how was Nicodemus, this Pharisee who got it, how was he transformed? Because when you read on through the end of this passage, it really seems like Jesus just kind of shifts gears and leaves Nicodemus in the dust. We don't hear much of him anymore. So the question becomes, uh, what became of Nicodemus? And was he ever born again? So, in chapter 7 of John's Gospel, Nicodemus appears again with some of his fellow Pharisees uh, who became angry at the temple police for not arresting Jesus for impersonating a Messiah. Nicodemus comes along and he sticks up for Jesus. And he said to his accusers, our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they're doing, does it? And the other Pharisees got mad at him and said, you know, what are you, a Galilean too, like your buddy Jesus here? Actually, they said, surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? But, you know, same thing, right? And then in chapter 19, Nicodemus shows up again after Jesus was crucified. He stepped in to help uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus who owned uh, the tomb that Jesus was to be buried in. Nicodemus helped Joseph remain anonymous so that the authorities wouldn't punish him for providing a decent burial for Jesus. Uh, Nicodemus also provided some very expensive myrrh and aloes so that Jesus could be buried with dignity. So Nicodemus used his power as a religious leader and his privilege to help uh, Jesus and one of Jesus' disciples. Throughout the history of the church, Nicodemus was lifted up by both Catholic and Orthodox traditions as being an example of one who sticks up for the church when it's under persecution from the forces of uh, corrupt religion or corrupt government. Now to the African Americans who were freed from slavery here in the United States after the Civil War, Nicodemus was a model of rebirth as they uh, sought to cast off their old identity as slaves. In fact, uh, there was a town in Kansas that was formed by former slaves called Nicodemus. Then, uh, in an August 16th speech in 1967, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King invoked Nicodemus as a metaphor concerning the need for the United States to be born again in order to effectively address social inequality. Nicodemus, like all of us, was born of water and spirit. But over time, he was reborn in the Holy Spirit. And it showed in his actions and his words as he matured and grew in the Spirit. As he was transformed by the power of the one who molds us and makes us into the image of Jesus. So may our Lenten experience be a time of transformation 
and rebirthed as we discover our call to live out our faith in Christ. Thank you so much uh, for showing up. And uh, believe me, I am not here today. I'm not, uh, I'm not in the building, but I am watching via Zoom. And uh, I appreciate the privilege of being your pastor. And I'm glad I, we have the technology to do this today.